네, 6다시 세션, 다시 2 세션 시작하도록 하겠습니다. We'll begin the session 6-2. Simultaneous interpretation will be provided in this session. Uh, Korean is number 3 and English is number 4. For Korean, it is tenor 3 and for English, it is tenor 4 on your receiver. 북한의 비핵화와 the session 6-2 uh, is uh, under the title Geopolitical Risk and the National Strategy Sharing Experiences of Eastern Europe and Northeast Asia. 네, 죄송합니다. 6-2, 지정화 위기와 국가 전략. The session title is Geopolitical Risks and the National Strategy Sharing Experiences of Eastern Europe and Northeast Asia. We'll begin the session. And first of all, we would like to invite the Chair Professor uh, Cho kwon sik of Hala University for the opening speech. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Good afternoon, my name is Jo Gwon Sik, who is the head of the Hala University Institute for the Northeast Asian Economic Research. I would like to thank Professor Yoon young Professor Emeritus of the Seoul National University, who has been serving in Korea as a foreign minister. This February, Russia named their operation as a special military operation, and they invaded Ukraine. And it's been six months. The Russian-Ukraine war has been ongoing for the last six months. So we have invited the experts from Poland who have a hands-on experience about this crisis. And they're going to tell us how things are going on the ground. Geopolitical risk and the national strategy sharing experiences of Eastern Europe and Northeast Asia. Under this topic, we have a wonderful presenters. Professor Tadeusz Zielinski, Professor Andrzej Sobon, also Professor Marlena Bulihash. Thank you very much for your visit to South Korea. Thank you very much. I also thank all the discussants, Professor Emeritus of Yu Ojong, Professor Kim Jin Ah from Hoops, Professor Park Kwang Ho, who is the head of of the policy in HINER, Professor Che Hee She from Professor University, and the research fellow Kim Gyu Nam from the Warsaw University. Thank you very much for your participation. Distinguished guests from Homer Road and those who are watching us on YouTube, I thank you very much for your participation. I sincerely hope that you can enjoy this meaningful session. H-I-N-E-R, in the beginning of the war, got the support from the War Studies University of the Poland and we dispatched three professors so that they can observe what is going on in Eastern Europe and they were researching very hard to find out the implication that can be applicable to Northeast Asia. We have been collaborating continuously with the World Studies University in Poland, and now we have a session just like this. This was possible because the World Studies University provided utmost support based on the EU Erasmus Plus program. Taking this opportunity, I would like to deliver my sincere appreciation to you. Today, I want to share a photo with you. This was released by the foreign policy, Ukraine in photos. You can see an old lady. She is 79 years old. She is holding a gun, and she is exercise shooting to protect Mariupol. What if war breaks out on the Korean Peninsula? This photo reminds me what I should do. And as you know, the crisis in Ukraine is not a just distant crisis. It can be directly related to you. Freedom 
is not free. The message comes deeply into my mind. After the Cold War, we were enjoying the freedom and liberalism, and we expected that there will be a co-prosperity across the globe. However, now we are facing a new Cold War. The talk of war among the superpowers can be observed across the world. Russia is threatening against Ukraine, and they are talking about the nuclear attack and destruction of the nuclear facilities. And as you know, in Northeast Asia, the superpowers are concentrated. U.S., China, Russia, Japan can have conflict of interest at any time. And we have the North Korean nuclear issue. Also, we have a 70-year-long national division on the Korean Peninsula. There can be risk at any time in this region. So we have invited the people from Poland the security experts will share their experience because they have a hands-on experience about the crisis. And we can share the experiences of the Eastern Europe and Northeast Asia so that we can make this world more peaceful and stable. And we should find out the solution together. And we have experts from the World Studies University. They're going to talk about the Ukraine war, NATO, before countries, current status, and security cooperation. Also, they are going to tell us about the media war and disinformation. In addition, we have Korean experts who have domain knowledge in those areas, and we're going to have some wonderful panel discussion. I sincerely hope that we can further enhance security and defense industry cooperation between Korea and Poland. Also, I hope we can in we can have more in-depth academic cooperation between the two countries once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Cho Kwon-sik. Thank you very much, Chair. Please give big hands once again to Professor Cho kwon who is leading the HINER. Now, I would like to invite the Professor Yoon Young-gwan from the Seoul National University. I'm Yoon Young-gwan, who is the Professor Emeritus of the Seoul National University. It is a great honor for me to see you all. And as you know, the world is changing lots of difficulties and the challenges, and the world is dynamic. It is changing so rapidly. And as you know, in February, February 24th, the Russia invaded Ukraine. And that is one of the most significant incidents. It is not just about the two countries. It can be the story across the Europe, and it can have an impact across the world. The international order can be changed because of this incident. This is a, such an important event. So at this critical juncture, from Europe, from Poland, we have a security expert, we have a wonderful three security experts, and we can have some discussion about this important topic. I believe this is timely and it's a great honor. Especially Poland and Korea share some history lessons. In the past, we were surrounded by the superpowers and we were going through some painful memories. So at this critical juncture, we need to share the ideas and to find out the cooperative ways. And we need to find out the lesson learned from the Ukraine war. This is a wonderful occasion. So I would like to thank the Hala University, especially President Cho kwon -sik. Thank you very much for making this event possible. We have three presenters, and they are going to speak in each about 15 minutes, one five, 15 minutes each. And from Korea, we have five panelists.
and the five panelists will lead the discussion. The total time given to us is only 90 minutes. So, 15 minutes for the panelists and 5 minutes, 5 minutes for the panelists. I know it is very limited amount of time, but please understand that we have only 90 minutes. And please help us so that we can smoothly operate this session. For those of you who are watching offline and online, you can ask a question, especially those on the online. You can click the question link and you can pose a question. Then I can collect the questions and I'm going to deliver that questions to the panelists here. First, I would like to invite Mr. Tadeushi Jeleski. Professor, the floor is yours. And he is the colonel for the Air Force, and he is the security expert in the EU. Please welcome him with weekends. Uh, good afternoon. First of all, it's a great pleasure to be here in such interesting event like uh, Korean Global uh, Forum for Peace. About this issue, should we discuss? And this place is uh, very good to do that. I would like to also emphasize that uh, all opinions presented during my speech are my own and shouldn't be um, associated with uh, my university or official line of Polish government. Let's start with the presentation. Today, I would like to brief you shortly with, uh, with short information related to strengthen the NATO flank, the Eastern NATO flank, in the context of war in Ukraine. Let's start with the short information about the relation between these two countries, I mean Ukraine in, in, and in Russia. It, it's not my intention to present the relationship between both countries, however, a background is needed to understand the roots of ongoing war. On the slide, you can see the crucial dates in Ukrainian-Russian relations. And the key moment for Ukraine was the dissolution of Soviet Union and regaining independence in 1991. Tensions have dominated relations between Moscow and Kiev since Ukraine's uh, 20, 2004 so-called Orange Revolution. It was a bloodless revolt overturning the fraudulental election of Russia-backed Viktor Yanukovych as a president. Yanukovych was nonetheless elected in 2010, but when he decided under Kremlin pressure to renege on a trade pact within, uh, with the EU, mass demonstration erupted and it was overthrown in February uh, 2014. Putin, who accused the US and the EU on instigating a fascist coup, responded with the seizure um, and annexation of the Crimea and to support pro-Moscow separatist groups in Ukraine that proclaimed two independent republics in the eastern Donbas region along the Russian border launching a conflict with the Ukrainian military. It is interesting how Putin's justified the full invasion. He accused Ukraine's government of genocide against ethnic Russians and native Russian speakers in the Donbas. He said an objective of the invasion was the demilitarization of Ukraine and the another thing was denazification of Ukraine. So so-called special military operations from Russia started this year in February However, we should remember that Ukraine stayed in permanent war against Russia since 2014. Let's move to the um, eastern flank of NATO. Um, how war in Ukraine changed attitude towards defense and security of uh, eastern flank countries? As depicted on the slide, uh, these eight countries, I mean Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, are those countries of NATO, which may be the front line of potential war against Russia. 
they differ each other, including uh, human assets as well as military and economical potential. For example, Baltic states and Poland support each other and speak with one voice in context of threats generated by Russia, by Russia from many years before the war outbroke. Citizens of Slovakia traditionally strike a positive note about Russians. On the other hand, they condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine territory. Hungary is probably the only EU country which opposed the sanctions against Russia and to support Ukrainian with uh, armament. Romania is supporting Ukraine, especially at the beginning of the war. However, the fire dropped. We can observe similar situation in Bulgaria as well. In context of strengthening of the eastern flank of NATO, I would like to sh mention about the Bucharest Night Initiative. All members of the B9 were either part of the former Soviet Union or the Soviet Union-led Warsaw Pact. B9 is the essential format for coordinating as well as showing a common position on security of the eastern flank. During the last meeting this year in June, the leaders stressed the importance of transatlantic relations and the light determination to defend every inch of NATO territory. They also recognized the need to raise the priority of collective defense and NATO as a NATO's main mission. But what about the ordinary people? How they perceive the war in Ukraine? You can see the result of survey in the screen about public opinion on the war in Ukraine. The survey was conducted by the European Council on Foreign Affairs, on Foreign Relations. In the first 100 days of Russia, Russia's war on Ukraine, European public opinion helped to solidify Europe's political response. But new poll reveals, the diverging, uh, reveals that diverging public preferences could weaken this unity. Research shows that while Europeans feel great solidarity with the Ukraine and support sanctions against Russia, they are split about the long-term goals. They are divided between a peace camp, is about 35% of people, that wants to the war to, to end as soon as possible, and the justice camp that believes that more pressing goal is to punish Russia, it's about 22%. In all countries, apart from Poland, the camp peace is larger than the justice camp. In my opinion, European citizens worry about the cost of economic sanctions and the threat of nuclear escalation. Another survey was conducted just before the NATO Madrid summit, and they shows that 67% of allied citizens think Russia's invasion of Ukraine has affected the safety and security of the country. You can see in the screen that countries of eastern flank of NATO are in the top of this survey. Why? First, I think that Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia openly support Ukraine's rapprochement with the European Union of NATO. Then I would say that they are also aware of real threat of Russian armed aggression spreading beyond Ukraine's border. That's why they want to strengthen the defense of their territories with NATO's permanent presence. And what is more important, I think that citizens of these countries lived under Russia's power and they really know what it means. Well, taking into account concerns of eastern flank uh, countries uh, which drastically rise uh, in 2014 after annexation of Crimea, uh, they started to call for strengthening this flank. In this context, two events have been important. The first one was uh, the NATO Wales Summit in September 2014 with very important message to allies. I mean back to the collective desert. It means that the uh, era of expeditionary operations conducted by NATO, by NATO finished, and NATO is backing to their roots, I mean collective defense, which is very important to eastern flank NATO. 
it means more military infrastructure, equipment, uh, troops, uh, uh, bases, and military exercises in the region. The second event it was Warsaw Summit on July uh, 2016, and during the summit, a decision was made about the so-called enhanced forward presence and tailored forward presence. I will talk later about them. On the screen, you can see the citations uh, from the newest NATO strategic concept endorsed during the Madrid summit this year in June. It's important to know that all allies perceive Russia as the most significant and direct threat to the allies, security and to peace and stability in the Euro-Atlantic area. The priority of NATO is deterrence and defense with the goal of denying and potential adversary opportunities for aggression. However, I think that with regard to conventional deter deterrence, there won't be any revolutionary changes when it comes to the development of forces on NATO eastern flank and no shift from a forward presence to forward defense, which Poland and Baltic states favored and which would be bring a significant increase in the Allied presence. I think that there are several reasons for this. Firstly, the diagnosis of Russia's relative military weakness and the conviction of NATO members that Moscow is not able to take aggressive actions against NATO after the invasion of Ukraine. Secondly, I think that reluctance of the largest member states to engage significant forces in the region on permanent basis. And thirdly, the lack of political will among some members for significant and rapid investment in military build-up because, you know, money is power. Well... An important component of NATO's deterrence and defense posture is military presence in the Eastern Pant Alliance territory. In recent years, allies have enhanced NATO's forward presence by establishing multinational battle groups in countries of eastern flank of NATO. These actions demonstrate uh, allies' solidarity, determination, and ability to defend alliance territory and populations. Following Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in, in this year, allies reinforced the existing battle groups and agreed to establish four more multinational battle groups in some countries. Well, on the slide you can see the strength of the eastern flank of NATO in numbers, including air domain. I would like to draw your attention to my country because, you know, war is not only battlefields, tanks, aircraft, and so on. Uh, the war is also suffering of uh, ordinary people, Ukrainians, who uh, has to uh, leave your country uh, before, uh, before the war. So, uh, I think that our country, I mean Poland, is a bigger supporter of Ukraine. We are neighbors with Ukraine, with hard history, but we, as a Polish, understand that the threats from Russia, neo-imperialist policy is very serious. As a Poland, we are the voice of the Ukraine in the EU and in international community. Our president and our representatives of government present a real situation of Ukraine inside many international forums, canvassing for supporting Ukraine and for weaken Russia in many areas, mainly by imposing uh, the sanctions. Since the outbreak of war in Ukraine, Polish authorities and hundreds and thousands of ordinary Polish citizens have taken immediate actions to protect, assist, and integrate Ukrainian refugees. Parliament adopted a special law granted Ukrainian citizens and their spouses equal access to the Polish labor market, health care, right to the education and other social benefits. National and local authorities in close collaboration with the Polish Border Guard and other relevant public services 
facilitated speedy border crossing, provided free transportation, humanitarian assistance, and medical aid for Ukrainian refugees fleeing the war. Uh, by the end of the last school year, some 200,000 new Ukrainian students had registered to attend schools in, Ponal, in Poland. Nearly 700,000 school-age Ukrainian children is preparing to accommodate in Polish school. Nowadays, we have about 3.8 million of Ukraine refugees in our country. However, since the February, of this year, 5.4 million cross the border. Poland is also the second largest donor of military aid, spending about 1.8 billion dollars in security assistance to Ukraine. We are the largest European provider of military equipment to uh, Ukraine, sending tanks, manpads, munitions, and many, many other um, equipment. Uh, from military point of view, I would like to point it out some lessons learned. Uh, of course, probably we don't have time to, to present this, so I would like to present some conclusions uh, related to, uh, to my topic. So, uh, first of all, in context of uh, eastern flank of NATO, uh, I would like to stress just general ideas, because we know the war is still ongoing and some experiences will be revealed after the war or even published uh, many, many years later. First of all, I, I think that state leadership is very important in order to consolidate society against adversary and to look for international support for defending of national sovereignty. As activities of President Zelensky show, one person, authority, is able to do more than many weapon systems or brigades. Then I would say that Russia's war against Ukraine is also the war against the West. Ukrainians are being killed simply because they are Ukrainians. Hospitals, infrastructure, cultural treasures, private homes and industrial centers are either destroyed or pillaged with stolen goods being sent to Russia with an organized manner. According to its own terminology, Putin's regime has chosen confrontation with the collective West, irrespective of the cost for Russia itself. Moreover, by creating economic shocks in the energy markets and weaponizing famine as a political instrument, Russia has further globalized the consequences of its words. Uh, do we have some time or not? A few seconds. A few seconds, okay. So, okay, the slide, you can see just uh, general ideas related to the eastern flight of NATO. One of is the uh, fourth, for, fourth force deployment. deployment. I mean, uh, still uh, we should uh, um, engage many forces in the Eastern Front in order to uh, defend our territories. And the main idea uh, should be exchange the forward presence into forward defense, because uh, the military potential of the Eastern Front of NATO, I mean countries, is less than whole NATO. So we expect that NATO will, uh, will uh, defend our territories. However, according to Article 5 of Washington Treaty, we are also still preparing uh, uh, for, um, for the future in order to strengthen our military capabilities. So thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for yeah. extending yeah. the time. Thank you. Thank <laughs> Thank you for the wonderful presentation. He talked about the east flank, the eight countries' solidarity and the cooperation. He talked about the military readiness and the cooperation. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Anjay Shobon, professor of the World Studies University. Please, he is the colonel for the Polish army. Please. Thank you very much, Professor, for so great invitation. 
Professor Chu also for you for uh, possibility for in invite me for this uh, uh, great <coughs> forum, Korea Glo uh, Global uh, Forum for, for Peace, not only for this perfect condition, but being in great group of scientists uh, and person who are uh, interested in peace. Peace, which is, uh, as Professor said, uh, element of our uh, learning outcomes or uh, our uh, history between two hours uh, countries. Ladies and gentlemen, not only 8,000 kilometers, which uh, is uh, distance between Poland and, uh, uh, and uh, Korea, uh, it is uh, my idea, but uh, also some information ab about Poland, uh, which is, uh, as Professor Zielinski said, one of the NATO countries located on the eastern flank of, on Poland. And some words, some words about our neighbors. If you, if you see the small violet color on the northern part of, of Poland, this is Russia. So it means that Poland uh, has the direct neighbor, Russia. Russia, which tried to join the uh, corridor between Belarus and Kaliningrad uh, uh, Oblast, Kaliningrad region, this violet color. But in Kaliningrad, Russia has built a formidable military presence, spanning nuclear, nuclear weapon in Baltic fleet and tens of thousands of soldiers. The exclave, which has a population of nearly one million the, the Moses are the soldiers. So in title, you can find also the acronym V4. It means the Weisgrad Group, which is a political alliance of four Central European countries, Czechia, Hungary, Poland, and Slovakia, in this way known as V4. The date of establishment of creation was adopted in 1991 when the president of Poland, Lech Wałęsa, and during this time, Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel, and also Hungarian Prime Minister Josef Antal signed the special declaration for preparing these three countries during this time for uh, being the part of Europe, for prepare the structure and market economy of this uh, country. But uh, since 1999, as Professor Zieliński informed me, we are the NATO countries, but from May 2004, all of these countries are in the uh, European Union. And the Weisgrad Group is the forum for exchanging experience and working out common position on issue important for the future uh, of the region and European Union. So apart from European issues, uh, cooperation with, with V4, Weisgrad Group, focused primarily on the matters related to Central Europe. Prior, priority areas of the group is the um, development of uh, transport infrastructure and the strengthening of energy security in the region. But uh, there is now a lot that divides this country. Uh, Elements for this is, of course, policy towards Russia and China. For both Warsaw and Budapest, the Weisgrad Group, Weisgrad Cooperation, had served as important diplomatic toll, but nowadays the two capitals, Warsaw and Budapest, are increasingly isolated. The first one is contracts between the four Central European partners. Uh, began last year when Prime uh, Minister Viktor Orban asked in Warsaw about the Moscow responsibility for the migration crisis on the Polish border with Belarus. He said that don't see any evidence on the matters to blame Russian President Vladimir Putin. From the Czech side, in March, the Czech Defense Minister uh, Jana Chernehova claimed that she always supported V4, but she is very sorry that cheap Russian oil is more important to Hung Hungarian politicians than Ukrainian blood. Also, the Polish Minister of Defense, Mariusz Błaszczak, declared that the Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, was making mistake. 
So does involvement or before in the war in Ukraine turn group into more of V3? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my title I divided in three, uh, three um, elements. The first one are about politics, the second about the social matters, and the last but not least about the security, which is close to uh, my uh, activity. It is in Weisgrad Group own security, in, uh, own security interest to support Ukraine thus preventing a larger European war that would involve military conflict on area outside of uh, Ukraine. Even the recent outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic has not made so substantial impact on cooperation like war in Ukraine. I will back to my question from the previous slide. Does involvement of V4 in war in Ukraine turn group into more of V3? Please listen uh, my uh, information. Budapest, what Professor Zielinski said, has refused to allow weapon to reach Ukraine through its territory. The second, Weisgrad group meeting of defense minister was cancelled after Poland and Czech Republic pulled out over Hungary tepid response to Russia's war on Ukraine. Next one, Poland sent about 200 different combat vehicles to support Ukraine. Slovakia decided to grant its fleet of Soviet-designed MiG-29 aircraft and started to send them to Ukraine. Czech Republic and Poland will send our fighters jet to protect Slovakia airspace. And also Prime Minister of Czechia, Peter Fiala, said that it's essential to support Ukraine in we weapons needed to fight for both Ukrainian independence and the West, West security and freedom. And the Czech Republic uh, Parliament finally pass as a resolution arguing the government recognize situation and war crimes in Ukraine as genocide. But not only Czech Republic, but also US and the other uh, um, country will uh, do the same. Professor, uh, Dr. Blichasz will also say about some propaganda war, information war. Hungary, is in very excellent relationship with uh, Putin and Russia. While we as the Poles and the Czechia facing the propaganda and some actions. I said about the uh, crisis on the uh, eastern border connected with uh, migrants which were invited by uh, Lukashenko to uh, Belarus for the reason connected with crossing the Ukraine, European Union border. And the, another fact is that also Russian Federation used the base uh, in Belarus to launch assault on Ukraine. But any of this fact, Hungarian Prime Minister Orban don't see any evidence on matter to blame Russian President Vladimir Putin. Poland, most powerful politician on your right, Jarosław Kaczyński, slammed Viktor Orban for refusing to condemn a Bucha uh, killing in Ukraine. In this case, Prime Minister Orban said that he cannot see what happened in Bucha because it can be manipulation. Poland has been one of the Europe's uh, first adv advocates for Russian energy uh, embargo. But for Hungary, it is too much, and uh, they are speaking about the uh, red line. Budapest is still doing uh, its the best not to pick at a side between the West and the um, Russian president. But in war in Ukraine, has strained Polish-Hungarian political friendship due to the Orban close ties with Putin. 
the first one, Putin has give Orban the cheapest gas prices in Europe. The second one, the Budapest received a special loan to fund the expansion project from Hungary's uh, nuclear power plant called Pax 2. And the last uh, element that Russia installed in Budapest International Investment Bank. It is moved me to the second point of the agenda, maybe a bit uh, uh, similar to what Professor Zielinski said, that uh, uh, Ukraine share border with our countries, but also Romania, Slovakia and Hungary. But this is in closest relation with Poland. But Poland has the little experience in so kind massive migration wave. The Polish government has pledged solidarity with Ukraine and said uh, people fleeing the country in case of Russian invasion would be real refugees and will receive help. In, in line with Geneva Convention, these people are under Polish protection and Poland will not say no to helping them. Before February 24, in Polish refugee centers were only 800 free available or free and available places. In this uh, condition, help for millions of people was in this time irresponsible. But what happened that more than 5 million uh, people entered Poland and received support? Because most of Poland and a lot of social organizations, mainly from Poland, of course, Slovakia, actively provide humanitarian aid for Ukrainian uh, refugees. However, pro Moscow, ruling Hungarian civic alliance Fidesz stop direct help. In Poland, many of uh, cities situated on the uh, eastern part were huge and still is huge hub for, of humanitarian aid. In countries like uh, Poland, Slovakia, refugees are being greeted, greeted with not tear gas and buttons, but warm meals, uh, free taxi riders, free Wi Fi pass, uh, passwords, and invitation to ordinary Polish uh, people uh, room. In lots of shops, we can observe uh, friendship with uh, Ukrainian. Uh, citizens, but also normal volunteers can be seen all over the train uh, and offer for them lots of uh, support. So what happened or is there one positive outcome of the war in Ukraine? It is look on the humanitarian support that more than five million people uh, receive mm, help. So, the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine has not only strengthened support for uh, Ukraine, but uh, also lead to increase in effort of improving security, especially in energy matters. What is the last point uh, of my speech? Despite uh, of some declaration or in, inside of Vice Group, some states pursue their own goals determined by economic interests. Despite the fact that perception of the Vice Group has changed since February 24, the declaration about the oil are uh, different. But solidarity with Ukraine is forcing European Union countries to uh, face gas, gas rationing as the Russia cut suppliers. Poland and other V4 countries refused to Kremlin demands to pay for deliveries in rubles, we, while under sanction, okay, under sanction, the SWIFT system was uh, blocked. From, from this reason, Poland and, and other countries from uh, April stopped receive the uh, Russian uh, ga gas. In 2021, 
uh, Gazprom supply 137 billion cubic meters of gas via pipeline to European uh, uh, countries. From this reason, Putin has enthusiastically uh, em uh, embraced Europe's weakness for Russian uh, energy, uh, turning gas into some potential economic uh, weapon. So far, as I said, 12 countries uh, cut off of Russia gas sent by Gazprom. The most likely scenario is that Nord Stream stay offline, as maybe you know that from today during the next three days, uh, Nord Stream is uh, offline. Also is some uh, expected another scenario, but uh, rather like a, a dream, that the uh, Russia gas flows through the other roads will be uh, stopped. Uh, there is my uh, some speech uh, Mm, because I receive information that is the, the, the time for, for, uh, for summary. So maybe I will only inform you about the Polish uh, activity, especially after the April, uh, April. So as you see, we were the best buyer of the Russian uh, energy, natural sources. 46% of gas, 64% of oil, 15% of coal, of, of, uh, which, we, which we need. But as the Polish government said, we will receive some of them till end of uh, this year. Of course, this is a big uh, challenge for, for us, for uh, Poland, for, for Poles, because our economy uh, is based on coal, coal which de facto we have in our natural resources. But still, we, we need m about three, five uh, million tons of coal for support for uh, heating houses uh, of, of uh, Poles. Of course, there are some possibility like river, but drought in this level and the lower level of, of the river uh, cancel this uh, uh, idea. How is in the other in other countries? Slovak Republic, Czech Republic is completely uh, joined with the Russian uh, natural resources, but uh, the another. Uh, activity. Another situation is Hungary, which cooperate with uh, with uh, Russia. So, uh, Pr Prime Minister uh, Orban believes that energy sanction and energy securities are as two different uh, concepts. Uh, Hungary, as I said, received a big loan for uh, build the plant, uh, nuclear plant, uh, in, uh, in in Hungary. And also, still, uh, gas and oil is uh, sent to Hungary via the Russians' uh, Turkish uh, pipeline. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is uh, all what I, what I prepare for you uh, in this uh, in topic. But uh, as a summary, I would like to say that the V4 country currently has no vision of what the energy security means and uh, must do everything uh, alone. B but ultimately, ultimately, there can be no energy security without national sovereignty. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, especially interpreter, for translate my, my speech. Yeah. Kamzamida. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. Professor Sobon talked about the before uh, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Poland. Uh, they are working together. So he explained uh, the cooperation among these countries. And you also talked about the humanitarian support and energy cooperation. As far as I know, uh, the population of Hungary, uh, Poland is about 36 million, and you received about 5.4 
four million uh, refugees. It is a very uh, surprising number, and it is bigger than I expected. So I think that it is very impressive. Then let me move on to uh, Professor Marlena Bliashi. Uh, from the uh, War Studies University, and uh, she will make a presentation. And she is an expert in East Asia security, and she also studied in Yongnam University once. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Professor. Maybe not yet an expert, but maybe in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, my name is Marlena Blichas. I'm representing National Security Faculty of War Studies University in Warsaw, Poland. And it's a big uh, honor and privilege to be here on this uh, very impressive event. Uh, special thanks to uh, Professor Cho and Professor Jung for inviting us uh, for, um, for the forum. Um, the topic which I would like to uh, present uh, to you, it's uh, Russian disinformation in Eastern Europe in context of war in Ukraine and beyond, uh, which, um, which is especially important for, um, for us um, in our um, part of the, of the world. Uh, it's almost 7,000 kilometers away from Seoul. Uh, however, um, repercussion of the other side of the world uh, have direct, uh, have direct uh, influence on the situation on the other side. Um, so I believe that we should speak about um, what is happening in Europe, uh, what is happening in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, because, of course, due to, um, I believe, other tensions and events that are happening in East, in East Asia, in Northeast Asia, uh, the number of informations probably is a little bit um, limited comparing to what uh, we are um, uh, listening in, in Poland. Um, okay, so uh, in the beginning, um, a small explanation, um, kind of introduction, why this is so important and why we all here, uh, representative of Poland, put so strong emphasis on uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, uh, it's the war, uh, the map of, of um, cent Central or, um, or Eastern Europe. Um, some people... Um, some people consider Poland as a Central Europe. Some people consider it as, a, as, a West, as, as an Eastern Europe. Uh, probably from a Korean's perspective, it's more uh, Western Europe. Uh, however, we as Polish, uh, we, um, we, we prefer to use uh, the term of Central Europe to somehow um, underline the difference um, from um, um, between our countries, because yes, we are part of the Slavic uh, world. Uh, we have Slavic language, however, the alphabet is different, the religion is different. Uh, we are not an Orthodox country. Um, and um, somehow our mentality is also different. Uh, please have a look on this map um, to also have uh, a picture why the problem is so big for us, why it's so crucial um, topic. Um, the neighbors of Poland are from the west uh, Germany, uh, from the south southwest um, it's the Czech Republic, which is the longest border. Uh, nearly 800 kilometers. And then in the south there is a Slovakia. Uh, in the east, it's a Ukraine, over 500 kilometers of border um, of Poland with Ukraine, then Belarus, Lithuania, and very tiny, uh, very short border, because it's only 200 kilometers with Russia, with uh, Kaliningrad Oblast. However, this very short distance generates the biggest problem for us. Uh, it's very direct threat to our security, um, and not only to us, because Poland, as a member of European Union and uh, NATO, uh, is also the, uh, the external border of the alliances. We are also external border of Schengen zone, meaning that uh, anyone entering um, Polish territory is able to travel very freely all over the uh, Europe, um, I mean all over the countries belonging to Schengen zone. 
Uh, okay, so we are traveling seven, uh, eight kilometers, uh, eight eight thousand kilometers away. Uh, we are in in the Ukraine, uh, just behind the border of, um, of of Poland, where actually nowadays war is happening, and we are facing the biggest humanitarian crisis in Europe after the Second World War. Uh, as this issue is so important, please forgive me that I'm repeating all these numbers, uh, but it's very important to, um, to keep it in mind. Uh, so 24th of February 2022, it was the first day of Russian unprovoked and unjustified military aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we cannot agree according to Kremlin rhetorics, that it's a special military operation. It's not a special military operation. It's a full-scale war. Um, I left empty space here because the presentation was prepared some weeks ago, and it was, there was a small hope that maybe there will be no need to say which day of the aggression it is. Maybe it, it was a hope that maybe it will be over, but not it's not. Uh, it's um, over 190 days of the aggression already. Uh, over half a year, the war just behind the Polish border. Um, both professors, Professor Zielinski and Professor Sobon, already mentioned um, about the um, refugees. I will underline it again. Um, refugees from Ukraine who were forced to left their homes um, after 24th of February 22 um, extend the number of 6.6 million of Ukrainians forced to leave not only the, the homes, because some of them just um, moved from one part of Ukrainian um, territory to more western, um, but including, um, including um, um, all, the, all the number uh, of those who were forced to go abroad, uh, it's 6.6 um, uh, million. I remind you that the population of Ukraine is um, more or less 40 million. Um, in this number, um, most of them reach um, Polish territory because Poland is the first country on the direction to the west. Um, so we were the most popular uh, destination, the way to um, escape from Russian aggression. And starting from the first day of Russian invasion, uh, more than uh, 5.6 million Ukrainians crossed the border with Poland. Of course, some of them only temporary, some of them just stopped by in Poland and then moved further to um, um, other European countries. But it makes a huge number, a huge uh, number of people who received support of Polish society um, just after crossing the border. Because it's important to underline that um, the support that was offered to Ukrainian um, refugees, initially, uh, initially it was very spontaneous uh, uh, action of Polish ordinary people, like us sitting here. The governmental programs, yes, it's a fact, it was established um, shortly after the aggression, but still it took some time because the legislation, the procedures, etc., formalities, it was needed to, to have some time to establish this uh, support. And what was very impressive for, for um, I believe, uh, all European um, countries, it was the very, um, uh, very um, impressive openness and his hospitality of uh, Polish families accepting refugees to their homes, uh, offering beds, food, and um, like treating them as the member of the family. Um, the last number that I mentioned here is the number of Ukrainians who came back, who returned to, uh, to their country. Uh, after the 28th of February, it was 3.5 million of Ukrainians who decided to return um, to, to Ukraine due to um, various reasons. Okay, so um, going to the store, sorry for this maybe too long introduction, however, for us as a Polish, it's a very important topic to speak about loudly. Um, my my uh, presentation is about the disinformation. I think that um, intuition tells 
us, we all know what disinformation is, because it's not a new concept. Uh, we have, um, unfortunately, we have um, we, are, we have contact with disinformation. We are observing it um, in our everyday life. However, um, I'm here uh, reminding some definitions by academics who are dealing with uh, this topic um, in their research. Um, so, um, disinformation is misleading someone by providing confusing or false information. Uh, it's also advanced formula of communication, the purpose of which is to evoke a view, decision, action, or its lack, in accordance with the assumption of the center, which planned the process of misleading the recipient. Uh, what is more, the disinformation content content does not have to be false, as the recipient can also be manipulated using information that is consonant with reality. Mm. Uh, next term uh, that is important uh, to um, explain, speaking about uh, such topic, is uh, disinformation operation, uh, which is understood as an action uh, similar with information psychological operation. Uh, with the psychological element remaining dominant, that is focusing on attempt to mislead the opponent. Additionally, the purpose of such, oper the purpose of such uh, operation should be understood by influencing a person or a human community in such a way that under the influence of the constantly imposed vision of a new world, the victim abandoned old ideas about the surrounding reality which in turn is to result in making decision consonant with the interest of the aggressor. And both uh, disinformation and, um, and uh, disinformation operations are uh, important of, uh, are element of uh, wars of new generation uh, that we are observing, um, um, for example, in, in Ukraine. Uh, from the side of, uh, of Russia. Uh, words of the new generations, uh, which are somehow um, replacing the war in traditional, understand in traditional meaning, uh, as, we, as we used to know it, um, combines information operation using the mass media, exploding division in the attacked society. Uh, it's bribing uh, members of the political elite of the victim state it's also uh, supporting sabotage and guerrilla groups um, and masking one's own actions by the use of the wide range of military, diplomatic and economic uh, measures. Um, the, wars of the, new gener wars of the new generation are focused on non-military uh, information and political activities. The task is to achieve uh, goals um, that are in fact typical for classic for classic uh, uh, for classic um, um, wars um, such like um, territorizing the population, paralyzing the armed force and state management system, breaking the enemy will to resist and overpowering, overpowering the uh, leadership elite. And the next stage is to use the military force in order to maintain the escalation control and achieve intended result. Um, war of the new generation, um, it's, um, um, it's uh, something that um, the doctrine of the war of new generation is um, developed uh, in Russia um, starting from um, 2013, meaning just before the invasion uh, in the eastern, eastern uh, Ukraine, uh, which started in 2014. And the, um, let's say, the face of, um, of this um, doctrine it's this um, gentleman speaking with uh, Vladim Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, um, Valery Veras, uh, Gerasimov, who is the general uh, of, of Russian uh, army and head of um, staff, um, general staff. 
and uh, he said that the rules of war have changed significantly. The role of non-military methods in achieving political and strategic goals has increased, and in many cases they have significantly exceed military power in their effectiveness. Uh, nowadays, it's uh, considered to be a um, most uh, important way of achieving strategic goals uh, um, by Russian Federation. Um, and what is the strategic goal? Uh, strategic goal is to um, build hegemony and uh, status of restore the status of Russian Federation as a superpower as it used to be during the previous era. And how is it going on? How uh, is it happening? Uh, here are the few examples of Russian disinformation um, which are connected with the war in Ukraine. And first example uh, is connected with... Um, um, I decided to put this example because it's connected with Asia um, somehow. Uh, it's the crash of Malay Malaysian air, um, air um, plane. Um, flight from uh, um, Netherlands to uh, to Malaysia uh, in 2014. That was um, shot um, from um, from Russian um, controlled separatist ter territory after the annexion of uh, Crimea. Um, according to, uh, it's, it's the result of international, um, international commission, okay, I forgot the word, investigation, yes, thank you. Uh, however, what is Russia saying is that um, the, um, the accident was, uh, was uh, planned and uh, was successfully uh, conducted by Ukrainian um, army. And as a, uh, there is a conspiracy theory about that, explaining, um, exp explaining and supporting uh, as in this, in this um, Russian theory, um, connected with the pilot of what this was Voloshin. He was um, uh, he was an officer in the Ukrainian Air Force who committed a suicide uh, two years after that, and Russian spread information about that as a confirmation that he was not able to handle the responsibility of um, hiding this information and um, th that's the tragedy had happened. Uh, second very, um, very uh, common um, rhetorics of, of Kremlin is that um, uh, is that the special military operation, what is happening right now, uh, was started uh, due, to, um, due to the need of protection of, uh, of Russian, um, Russian uh, nationalities, especially children, uh, in eastern part of uh, Ukraine. Um, of course, it's a manipulation at all, because um, according to... Uh, uh, according to the statistics, uh, due to the Russian aggression, uh, over 10,000 uh, civilians has died uh, uh, because of uh, mostly um, missiles attacks. Uh, among them, significant group of children. So, no, it cannot be explained as uh, saving uh, children uh, with this special operation. Would you please wrap up, please? Yeah. Okay. Um, I like this. Uh, I like this correspondence. I would say uh, um, of um, embassies in the Republic of South uh, Africa between Russia and German. Uh, Russians um, announced on Twitter that they uh, feel very grateful for the support that is uh, sent to to them. And, uh, supporting uh, special military operation and fighting with Nazism in Ukraine. Uh, as you can uh, read, Germans replied to them, and li I like this response so much, so uh, that's why I decided to include this screen on, on my presentation. Uh, Germans replied that, um, sorry, but we are kind of experts in Nazism, and no, it's not a, a, a fighting with Nazism, just as a curiosity. A very uh, prompt response of uh, German embassy. Um, next fake news that is uh, very was very popular 
uh, is connected with uh, Ma um, uh, city Mariupol. Um, I think that we all over the world who are observing um, and following information about all those heroes in um, Azov Battalion, um, Azov, it was, unfortunately, it was a metallurgical combinat um, that became a base, the last base for uh, Ukrainian soldiers um, trying to defeat Mar Mariupol. And they were, um, th there was no uh, way uh, um, to provide resources to them, no food, no evacuation of uh, of, of uh, people wounded. That's why uh, the Russia um, was spreading disinformation that there are very um, uh, very horrible things happening there. That uh, cannibalism in Azov Battalion is 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 a, is a fact, but no, it's not a fact. It's a fact news, and um, defenders of Mariupol and Azov Battalions are definitely uh, heroes of Ukraine. Um, something connected very directly with Poland, um, because uh, after the Second World War, um, the new order somehow was established, the new uh, borders of, of the countries uh, were established, and uh, also the borders of Poland has changed. Uh, our border were moved from east to the west. We lost some territories in the east, and we gained some territories in the west, which previously were German. So. Um, we, we get uh, territories, uh, we lost territories uh, on the territory of current Lithuania and Ukraine. And, uh, you, but it happened a long time ago, um, and it's not an issue anymore in Poland. And what Russia is um, saying that uh, Polish involvement in Ukraine, uh, it's because uh, Warsaw plans, um, has plans of annexion, action action. Um, of uh, Ukrainian state and regaining uh, territories and cities which were taken uh, after the Second World War. But no, believe me, believe us, it's not. Um, there is lots of another stories that we can um, speak here uh, about. There, there is uh, uh, also um, lots of problems with Belarus, which we are facing for over one year, um, starting with the migration crisis um, uh, last, uh, that, that started last, um, last summer. But uh, it's not, unfortunately, enough time for that. Uh, if you are interested in it, I can provide you some more information. And for now, that's all. Thank you so much for, um, for your attention. We, I'm sure that we all stand with Ukraine uh, and with the truth. Um, if you want to contact me, here is my email address. And uh, we are all welcome. Uh, we will all welcome you uh, in Warsaw. Thank you so much. 예, 감사합니다. 아, 이 정보라고 하는 Thank you so much. Information is a critical factor in the battle. The disinformation and the fake can be the foundation for the critical warfare. Thank you very much for the explanation. Now, let's start the discussion. Professor Yu Ojang from Hala University first. He is currently the professor of the Global Business Department. Professor Yu, please. I'm Yu Ojong from Hala University, especially those who, who are traveling afar from Poland. Thank you very much for your presentation and you are close neighbor of the Ukraine and you explained about the NATO status and the strategy. Also, you talked about the disinformation. Thank you very much for the interesting and in-depth analysis. I was able to get some insight. Korea is working on the aggressive and flexible diplomatic actions and we want to find out the ground so that we can get some international help in the case of emergency. As a panel, I was wondering what I should tell you. 
But one thing I can say is this. So all of you are the security experts and the experts in the battle. So I would like to focus on the battle and the war. The war in Ukraine gave lots of the opportunity to Russia. And probably the nuclear ban, which has been made for about 70 years, can be broken. The nuclear weapon is a threat to the Korean Peninsula. However, things can change. In last April, Kim Yo-jong made an announcement. Kim Yo-jong from North Korea said that the nuclear weapon can be the tactical weapon that can be used in the early stage of the war, and it can be used against South Korea. That was clear message from Kim Yo-jong. And through this war, Probably North Korea learned a lesson. Ukraine, when it was declaring the independence, had many nuclear weapons. It was number three. However, because of the pressure from the Russia and the US, they gave up all the nuclear weapons and transferred all the nuclear weapons to Russia. They abandoned nuclear weapons, and North Korea is watching what is the consequences of giving up the nuclear weapon? So, the Ukraine crisis is clearly delivering the message that North Korea should not give up the nuclear weapon. So, the nuclear threat is bigger. And it is really difficult to work on the denuclearization in the Korean Peninsula. The new administration of South Korea launched a audacious initiative. They want to give some economic incentive and better livelihood to North Korean citizens. If it can be accepted by North Korea, it can be great. However, so far, North Korea refused to accept the offer from South Korea. Under this situation, what kind of options are on the hands of South Koreans? The first option South Korea can take can be to have a nuclear weapon so that we can have the nuclear balance between South Korea and North Korea. I know that's very radical and aggressive idea. However, in the long term, it is worth considering because North Korea is armed with a nuclear weapon. We have only traditional and conventional weapons, and we are investing lots of money. We still have the security concern because of the nuclear weapon of North Korea. But if, if somehow South Korea has a nuclear weapon, paradoxically, there can be better cooperation and exchanges between the two Koreas. Because of the inter-Korean exchanges, the USD that South Korea sent to the North Korea allegedly have been used for the nuclear weapon development. So, I would say once we have the balance of the power, we can have the peace. However, what matters is the feasibility. Realistically, Korean people would not like the idea. And as you know, Korea is export-driven country. There will be serious sanctions and the consequences from the international community. It is impossible for Korea to develop a new nuclear weapon. Then what can be the option? Kim Jong-un is working on the advanced nuclear weapon, and Kim Jong-un declared that they are going to make a light and small tactical nuclear weapon. Even though the impact will be smaller, but it's going to be more accurate. That kind of small nuclear weapon will reduce the collateral damage, however, they have more nuclear usage option, which means people can 
openly use nuclear weapon if they have more and more options. So we need to get prepared so that there will not be any warfare or any war. Even when we have a conventional warfare, it is really necessary to work on the deterrence so that North Korea will not use its nuclear card. If North Korea is using the nuclear weapon, we should deliver the clear message. There will be a significant retaliation. I sincerely hope this kind of strategy can be researched in depth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You suggested a very innovative idea about uh, the nuclear power in North Korea, and you also uh, argued that uh, South Korea needs to consider the uh, nuclear options. And we'll move on to uh, the next uh, pre uh, panelist, uh, Kim Jin Ah. Uh, he is a professor. She is a professor at Hangul University of Foreign Studies. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, due to the limited time, I will be brief. Today, we are talking about the geopolitical risk and what kind of reaction is now taking place in each country. That was the focus of the session. In East Europe, how countries solidated and how they are responding together, it was well summarized by the presentations. But eventually, on the globe, in any other areas, when there is another geopolitical risks, I'm wondering whether uh, they will cr create global coalition. I would like to put a question mark on that. So the Ukraine case can be a critical case, and in the future, when there is a geopolitical risk, uh, we uh, can also use this uh, situation as a litmus test so that we can see what will happen in the future. So we can expand our scope to the North uh, European region and uh, we would like to assess uh, what kind of reaction they are showing to this Ukraine war, because when we look at the situation, depending on the countries, uh, the reaction is different. Of course, in the European region, they are providing military support and economic and financial support. But uh, most of the countries in other regions are trying to do the hatching instead of the balancing. And uh, for those countries trying to achieve the balance, there are two types. The first one is providing physical goods and uh, some countries are doing hard balancing by providing the uh, physical support. But there are some countries achieving the soft balancing by just sending signals instead of providing physical support. And it is the same for the countries for hatching. There are some countries who are maintaining the neutral position with the ambiguous uh, stance. And there are also some countries who are neutral, but at the same time, uh, they are making some decisions. Uh, one example is India. And for the second group, uh, China, Vietnam, and other countries will be included. So I believe that we need to have a comprehensive assessment. And when there is another global crisis, uh, what kind of group uh, will be our t uh, target and how we can create the coalition? We can learn the lesson from the Ukraine war, and I hope that we can have more opportunity to exchange the information. Thank you very much. Regarding the Ukraine war, the global coalition can be possibly built. And thank you very much for your insight. Next, I want to invite the Professor Park Kwang Ho from Hala University. He was the Director General of the Ministry of Unification. And finally, the opportunity was given to me 
Today is really important because after the Russian aggression on the 25th of the February, Ukraine protected itself and there was a stalemate. And according to the news that I saw, Ukraine is now starting its attack, especially on the southern side. So they are over the big watershed. I mean, things are changing. Ukraine was fighting back really well thanks to the support of the U.S. and many of the European countries. The U.S. was the biggest contributor for the support. The largest contribution came from the U.S. But in Europe, many countries supported Ukraine, especially Poland. Poland was most active, as far as I know. Of course, considering the site, Germany was a bit inactive. Poland was supporting Ukraine really actively. And we have a big industry cooperation deal between your country and our country. Actually, that's a welcoming news to South Korea. And we become closer because of the large deal in the defense industry. I think what matters is energy. Winter is coming. Russia is handling the European energy sources. And European is cut down the Russian energy. And Russia is cutting down the supply of the energy. So, Winter is coming. The energy price will become 10 times higher. This winter will be really critical. Well, Russia's financial sources is coming from by selling the oil and gas. For the Europe, without the Russian energy, they cannot sustain the life. So they are tightly aligned. However, it's more like a, they are losing the game, each other. It's a negative sum game between the two. If the energy crisis continues, well, in the European region, many people, I mean the many citizens, will oppose against the war. And if time allows, and I hope if any of the Polish speakers can answer this question, and from Russia, as the energy price is going up, even though they are importing only small amounts, but they can earn a lot of money because the price is so high. However, there is a financial sanction, so I am not sure whether that financial outcome is going into Russia. The production is the same, however, the import volume is going down. And Russia now have the surplus of the energy production. I'm wondering how they are storing the surplus of the energy production. The war will be eventually finished. And after the war, the recovery or the reconstruction of Ukraine will be really important. I know much of the country has been destroyed. To recover that, according to the Ukraine estimation, it's going to be around 700 billion USD. How to finance that 700 billion USD will be critical. And from Europe and from the international society and international community, what kind of financial support and the support should be provided to Ukraine? And also, what is the role and the responsibility of the South Korea for the recovery process of Ukraine?
And if you have any idea, please let us know about this. After the war, the reputation of Ukraine will be totally different. They can be a member of the EU and possibly they can be a member of NATO because they are considering that so seriously. If Ukraine becomes a member of the NATO, how about Poland? And you are, in that case, are you out of the eastern flank of the NATO if Ukraine becomes a member of the NATO? You talked about the energy issue, reconstruction of Ukraine. You touched upon various current issues. Moving on, I would like to invite uh, Professor Choi Hee-sik. Is it here? Yes, he is joining online. Professor Choi, he will uh, make a comment. So he is the uh, professor from Kungmin University. I will give you five minutes. Please keep the time. Yes. Uh, I was confirmed with COVID-19, so I was not able to be there in person, so please understand. Recently, in Korean Academic Society, uh, there are uh, discussions of a hybrid war and recognition war and energy, uh, energy security and refugee. Those are big topics. So we are closely looking at the Ukraine war and uh, through the presentations, I was able to learn many things, and I believe this is very important information uh, to think about the East Asian security. So thank you very much. And I would like to talk about Japan uh, in relation with the energy uh, security. Uh, there is a Hali 2 project. So uh, the oil and gas uh, project was conducted. Uh, Russian government created the company. And under the approval of the Russian government, uh, companies uh, were able to participate. And and the Russian government had the rejection power. So the UK shale companies decided not to participate in the project. However, uh, Japanese uh, companies decided to participate in the project again. And uh, Japanese companies already uh, signed the uh, contract to purchase the LNG gas. So, uh, when it comes to the international cooperation, politics, and energy security, there might be some conflicting situation. In the global value chain, energy security is part of it. And without the reshuffling of the supply chain for natural gas and oil, it would be difficult for us to maintain the global order. So surrounding uh, the natural gas, there should be the reorganization of the supply chain. Otherwise, international cooperation would not be possible. Uh, we can learn this from Japanese case because uh, Japan is a country doing hard balancing, but still, due to the energy security, uh, they are experiencing a dilemma. So, uh, Japan inevitably uh, has to uh, do some action that is opposing uh, the Western society. And second point, the Ukraine crisis can be the future of the East Asia uh, because of the uh, Taiwan issue. In European region, uh, now dynamism is changing and it will change the global dynamism. And in East Asia, 
Uh, there might be some aggressive uh, position of China against Taiwan. That's why Japan is actively participating in the hard balancing. And now there are two triangles, uh, DPRK, China and Russia, and US, Japan and uh, RK. So there might be changes in this dynamism. And, and the position of Japan might not be in line with uh, the East Asian countries. Currently, the Korean government is conservative government. So now the Korean government is in line with the Japanese government. But considering the domestic situation, uh, now, in the future, uh, there might be possibility that uh, Korean government is not in line with the Japanese government. In the presentation, there was an uh, explanation about Poland and Hungary. And I believe we need to look into uh, these two different reactions of Poland and Hungary. So I would like to ask you about the reaction of Hungary. How do you assess their responses? Anyways, uh, we talked about the refugee issue, energy issue, and recognition war. So there were many food for thoughts. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude my uh, comment. Thank you very much, Professor Choi. He talked about the energy supply chain issue, taking the example of the Japan. Last but not least, we have Dr. Kim Kyuna from the Warsaw University. And he's currently teaching at the Hanguk University of the Foreign Studies. He studied in Warsaw. I have a small PPT. And thank you very much. I would like to tell you about the the diplomatic policy of the Poland, especially focusing on the Hungary and Ukraine. So Polish diplomatic policy is to join the NATO and EU as much as possible, building friendly relations with the neighboring countries, participating in the regional cooperation and the global market. They dispatched their troops to Afghanistan and Iraq, and they participated in the U.S. missile defense, and they wanted to maximize the Polish interest. However, the Budapest diplomatic policy is a bit different. They want to become a part of the Euro-Atlantic system. They want to be friendly to many of the neighboring countries. They want to protect the ethnic Hungarian people. And they are building the practical relations with Russia and China. Especially in the energy sector, they are active partner of Russia. So that is why the Hungary's response to Ukraine is a bit different. In the case of the Poland, and they can have the alliance and they can hit the, hit the power balance. However, in the case of the Hungary and the Budapest, they have more economic relations. And the commonality between the two countries is they are in the middle of the Europe and they are working on wide diplomacy and they are trying to shut off the pressure or the power from many other neighboring countries. Their identity is different and their relations with the neighboring countries is different. For example, the Orthodox Church their identity is different, and also their membership to the NATO and the EU is different. Historic difference, historic side are also different, because in the past, Poland and Lithuania has a federation in the past. So, Poland internally has the PIS, it is a conservative department, it's a Catholic and conservative party, and they have the legitimacy against Russia. 
and they have been working on the policy against Russia. However, they do not have the consistency about the humanitarian support. The diplomatic partnership is the Eastern Partnership. They have some of the key partners like Armenia, Georgia, Moldova, and Azerbaijan, and they are trying to encourage those countries to come into EU. And they want to take the initiative in the European Union, and they have the historic legitimacy, and they are trying to build their legitimacy against Russia. The Polish stand will lead the international response against the war crime in Russia, and they are going to have the policies that is going against the former Soviet Union and against Russia. And Poland has a kind of the experiment so that they can have some intervention into other countries' politics. That's what I have, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. We had a presentation from uh, three Polish people, and we also had a panel discussion of from five Korean uh, people. And we are 10 minutes behind the schedule. So we are supposed to have the follow-up discussion, but uh, we are not able to do that. So please understand the situation. Uh, it is very shame. I serve as a moderator uh, in many occasions, uh, but we have too many participants in short time so it is rare to see this kind of setting, uh, but I would like to ask your understanding that I rushed you, and if there is anything we didn't cover, please understand. If I summarize the discussion in one word, I would say that uh, Korea and Poland have very similar geopolitical risks and dilemma, and we have similar concerns and dilemma. That is the current situation. In the European region, in particular from the perspective of Poland, how we can uh, look at uh, the Ukraine war, uh, what was the responses, and how we can look at it would be a lesson for us to prepare for the any uh, unexpected situation. So I would like to extend my deepest appreciation to three presenters. And in February 22nd, Russia, uh, two days before the aggression of Russia, at uh, the UN Security Council, the Kenya ambassador made a speech. If African countries act like uh, Russia, then for the last 40 years, uh, Russia, uh, sorry, Africa would be a, a, bad, a sea of blood. We stayed uh, still, uh, be, not because we are satisfied with our borderline, rather we wanted to keep our peace. That's why we stood still. So, uh, very critically, the ambassador uh, criticized uh, the Russian action. Anyways, global coalition is now formed, and maintaining the coalition is very important. And we also need to stop the aggression of Russia. And another key word was the energy issue. In the European region, uh, Russia is now weaponizing uh, the energy. So how Russian, uh, how European countries endured the winter is very important. And for Russia, the important thing is how they can endure the sanction. But in 
As far as I know, they are in a very difficult situation. Several weeks ago, there was an article of Financial Times, and EU expected that uh, the growth rate of this year will be 2 to 3 percent, and Russian growth rate will be negative 10 percent. So in the Western society, internally, they have many difficulties, but still, I believe the sanction is working. And from the perspective of the Korean people, not just Ukraine, but also uh, Poland, showed their courage, efforts, and cooperation. So I would like to pay my respect, and I would like to wrap up the session. Thank you very much.